I want to talk about axial precession, which is a complicated thing and it involves rotating objects. So axial precession is where you've got an object which is spinning and whenever you've got a spinning object there's this strange effect that when you try to twist it one way or the other it never quite the axis it's processing the axis is rotating about never moves in the direction you're expecting it to and in fact generally starts to move around like that. Here's the Earth, which looks like a perfect sphere, only it's not, and it's rotating, and we hope we've got it the right way round this time. I'm also going to be talking about a gyroscope. If I were to take this gyroscope and just leave it there, it's quite well balanced, and if I rotate it around, and it stays where it is. If it's perfectly balanced, nothing moves. And now, just let me move this thing, this extra weight, so this is unbalanced and then you can see the effect of changing the balance. If I put it there, this will drop down, it will oscillate in a very simple-minded way, just like a pendulum. So now let me rotate this, and everybody seeing this will imagine that the effect of rotation is just to let this drop down, but it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that at all. This motion round is called precession. It precesses around this axis, so I'm going to call it axial precession. And you can see that it's rotating round at a finite rate, which is fairly slow. But if I made this come further out and put more force on it, it would go a little bit faster. So this is an effect due to the fact oops, that this is trying to push it downwards but as it's trying to push it downwards with no counterbalancing force on the other side, it actually goes the other way. It starts spinning that way. The trouble is you tend to look at a spinning object and think of it as just kind of a single entity. And actually, of course, what's going on is there's different bits of it that are all actually moving around in a circle. So there's actually quite a complicated system here of different bits all rotating around. And really, when you try and then change the orientation of the thing, you're try trying to change a whole bunch of different objects and make them all move to different places and move in different directions. Well, the, the direction it rotates in depends on whether I make it go that way or the other way. So if I spun it the other way, it would... Have I got it the other way? <laughs> I've probably got it the same way. If I got it go the other way, then it will rotate backwards. So the direction of this rotation has a big effect. If it goes the other way, it will process in the opposite direction. So the question then is, is there any effect like that on the Earth? So if I take this sphere, one question that arose early on is, because of the spinning of the Earth, is it squashed at the poles and fatter at the equator, or is it elongated at the poles, a prolate ellipsoid they call it, and narrow at the and, and people really didn't know the answer to this. René Descartes predicted that it was going to be fatter at the poles, whereas Newton worked out that a spinning object would be fatter at the equator. The French Academy of Sciences in 1715 sent an expedition to Peru, somewhere over here, near the equator, and to Lapland, somewhere up there, near the pole, to see if there was a difference. And they came back did the experiment over 10 years and worked out that it was fatter at the equator. In other words, the Earth is not as it's here, but it's got a bit of blue tack, an extra bit of bulge round the equator. If you have a perfectly spherical spinning object, then it won't actually process at all because there's really no difference as you, re as you reorient it, it doesn't really change at all. But because the Earth is slightly oblate, it's slightly squashed, um, that means that if you reorient it, you're actually kind of changing the configuration of the whole Earth. And so the Earth is a spinning, non-spherical object. And that means that when you try and twist it, the axis that it's rotating about will start to process around. So because it's spinning, it doesn't want to go that way. It wants to waggle around very slowly, like this. This is called the axial precession of the Earth. Now that is quite amazing, but even more amazing is the fact that uh, there was a, a Greek guy who in about 120 BC, measured it. Newton was the one who actually understood what the effect was, but in fact the measurement of the effect, the measurement of this procession, goes back much further than that. There's some argument about who the first person who actually made the measurement uh, actually was, but it seems likely that one of the first reliable measurements was actually Hipparchus in about 150 BC, um, who did this very clever thing of measuring the positions of stars relative to the sun, 
uh, at a particular, on a particular date and then compared them to previous measurements that had already been made and showed that actually on that date the stars weren't in the same position relative to the sun. It's a bit of a, a tricky one because of course you want to measure the position of stars relative to the sun but of course if you want to see the stars the sun's not usually around because you see stars at night uh, and if you want to see the sun stars aren't usually around because you can't see the stars during the day. Um, so, but he had this very elegant way of doing it which was that he waited for a lunar eclipse which is when the Earth comes between the Sun and the Moon. And, and so when there's a lunar eclipse, you know that these three planets are exactly in a line. Sorry, two planets and the Sun are exactly in a line. And that means if the Moon's over there, you know that the Sun has to be 180 degrees away in completely the opposite direction. So what he do is, is waited for this lunar eclipse, then measured the positions of stars relative to the Moon, and then just added 180 degrees to his measurement, and that told him how far that star was away from the Sun on the sky. The other important point is that the Earth isn't completely spherical. Uh, if the Earth were really a completely spherical object, then you could actually just uh, change its orientation and, and none of these processional effects would occur. What's, where does the bulge at the equator come from? The bulge at the equator comes from the idea that this is rotating. When I, when I lived in New York when I was a young lad, they used to, in the Italian restaurants, get bits of dough and stand in the window and they'd twirl it around and throw it up in the air. And the more they threw it up in the air, the more it spread out. Well, here you've got the earth and it's not a piece of pasta and you can't throw it up in the air nicely. But if you were to, and it's spinning around fast enough, you could imagine that the sort of centrifugal forces would pull it out at the equator and squash it down at the top and bottom. So what actually happens is that the Earth, instead of, instead of actually tipping up, starts to process around so that the, the uh, axis of the Earth slowly moves around uh, in sort of absolute coordinates. But because the forces involved are actually very small uh, and the Earth's mass is very large, the timescales are very long. It, it processes on a time scale of about 26,000 years. It takes about 26,000 years for the Earth's axis to process around. If it weren't this squash sphere, it would then rotate and it would act as though all forces acted in the middle. And it's this small, non-spherical nature of the Earth which leads to this axial procession. So although in, in qualitative terms to sort of understand what these torques do and so on is relatively straightforward, uh, the mathematics is rather more complicated and of course the other thing that complicates things is in the solar system. For example, um, the Earth and the Moon and the Sun are not always in the same orientation. So sometimes you know, the Earth's on one side of the Moon and the Sun's on the other side of the, uh, of the Earth, so they're all you know, oriented different ways around. Sometimes the Sun and the Moon are both on the same sides of the Earth. So the, even this torque effect, how the Earth is being tugged around, changes with time. Uh, and that leads to a whole other thing, this whole thing called nutation, which is there are sort of shorter term wiggle, wiggle, wobbles of the Earth's axis on sort of timescales of eight years that are then superimposed on this long timescale 26,000 year effect.